Because if there is an iota of doubt based on which the NHRC gives order, please remember that can be challenged before the High Courts. There are many state governments who are challenging the orders of the state, uh, National Human Rights Commission. We ourselves have almost filed about 70 odd cases against the NHRC, not agreeing with the procedure as well as the final order before the Delhi High Court. So please remember, it is also responsibility of the, when NHRC gives an order, what you know as the truth, if you cannot establish with the evidence, it's very, very difficult. And of course, the scrutiny uh, will not be as hard as in the judiciary. It, they can take the uh, course to probability and give a sympathetic judgment. But please remember, even in that case, they require some evidence. Otherwise, it cannot go in your favor because no members of the NHSC wants their order to be challenged before the High Court. Government is a bit bad defender of itself in the court. NHSC is worse than that. NHSC registers about 100,000 complaints per year. We file possibly about 300 to 350 complaints a year. Do we represent somebody who can speak about the NHRC? Surely not, because the type of complaints which we file are on particular issues. We have certain kind of expertise. You know, I mean, so the complaints themselves, when they are filed before the National Human Rights Commission, they actually vary from NGOs to NGOs, organizations to organizations. And how many organizations present here actually approach National Human Rights Commission systematically to form a substantial portion of the 100,000 complaints to make an opinion of the NHRC. No, it is very, very difficult. So it shows that the huge number of victims across the country who are approaching the National Human Rights Commission without the support of the NGOs on their own. So there are citizenry of this country who are approaching the National Human Rights Commission. So what we have is essentially a perception. It is not necessarily the truth about the complaints handling because each complaint depends on so many factors as each case depends when you are adjudicating before uh, the judiciary. Uh, before I make this final comment, just there are issues which have, uh, I want to highlight for the distinguished members of the tribunal. There are issues which are beyond the competence of the NHS. You cannot blame NHSC for everything. You cannot blame NHSC for the appointment. You cannot blame the NHSC for the composition, for the selection, powers, functions, finance, legislative measures. At the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the government of India. NHSC cannot invite Suhas Chakma to be a member of the commission because they don't have the mandate. So there have to be some what say, specific recommendations which relates to the parliament, the executive, and some member, some recommendations. I, I think we all know okay. government that are created. That doesn't mean NHSC can't be blamed. Yes, sir. I, I think once I finish, you can come back to that. So, that, so there are distinctions. So there are two ways to look at it. One of the ways to look at it is the powers of the NHRC, which are legislative matters, and the issues which fall within the mandate of the NHRC. Complaint handling is something which can be tackled by the NHRC because they do not require any support uh, from legislatures. As far as the complaint handling is concerned, when the NHRC started, there were no specific dates when the next case will come up. We have cases which have taken about five years to be shelved, to be taken out from the files. At least in the last one year, with the help of the current register, they have introduced one system that when this current complaint is heard today, the next date of the hearing should be put in the file. And this was even missing in the NHRC because uh, there were no hearings. There were complaints which were not considered even once for five years. <laughs> The second problem with the NHRC is that when a complaint is filed, both the complainant and the estates are not given equal access to the documents. So when an NGO files or a victim files a complaint, it is immediately forwarded to the, uh, uh, the, the, the complainant, uh, sorry, to the government. But when the state responds, those responses, NHRC exercises its discretion. And discretions could be arbitrary and abusive. So there are many cases which we ourselves file that we are not informed and by the time we are informed, you know, I mean, the, many of the important proceedings are over, so it is not possible for us to uh, make an um, appropriate intervention. And on these issues also we have gone to Delhi High Court, saying that both the respondent and the complainant should be given equal time. And in terms of the time, NGOs are hardly given four weeks, 
and the states are usually given at least 12 weeks to 6 years, 16 weeks or sometimes more than that. So unless and until I think there is uh, equal time and equal opportunity in terms of dealing with the complaints, it becomes very discriminatory because the NGOs, the victims uh, themselves uh, are not uh, able to uh, effectively contribute. And one of the key problems at the moment, the proceedings of the NHRC, all the proceedings of the NHRC are not informed to the complainant. So one of the recommendations which we had the, before the NHRC and still have been implemented, the DUA, the daily orders of the high courts or the lower courts are uploaded. Why can't the NHRC maintain those orders in their websites? This has not been done. And it creates a serious problem because you have to follow up if you are following up 2,000 cases every month almost you are examining 2,000 complaints in the website of the NHRC to know what is the status because if you cannot examine them then you cannot make effective submissions at that point of time. So there are problems with the Suomoto actions. With Suomoto actions the NHRC has not developed any guidelines. So because of the lack of guidelines in what matters the NHRC should intervene Suomoto, it becomes very arbitrary and it's very unclear as to in some cases where they intervene and where they do not intervene. So I think on all these issues which I have mentioned, uh, I think uh, NHRC can improve, can improve beyond the Paris principles. Please remember when the Paris principles were adopted in 1992, they were based on one man ombudsman's experience in Europe. The Paris principles do not comply with the basic standards we espouse today. And because of the Paris principles, you have even the policy institutes, like the Danish Institute for Human Rights, as a full member of the, NH of the ICC without actually the power to adjudicate 